it was the most frustrating thing to really like have to realize and be real with myself about but that's just what we're dealing with here and that's the only way to get into law school What's up guys? Welcome back to my channel. My name is Bex, BX, and in this week's video, we're going to be finally talking about the dreaded LSAT. Now, um, if last week I was supposed to be talking about the LSAT as a part of the law school series, I put a pause on the series because of current events and I felt like I needed to get some stuff off my chest and this channel, wanted, I wanted to make sure that this channel isn't just about education and law school and and whatnot even though that is a part of my life i also want to make sure i'm talking about all, all parts of my life on this channel so i wanted to use this platform to do that so if you didn't check that video out already make sure you go ahead and x out of this one check that out and then come back and we can talk about the lsat okay now that you're back hello welcome this week we're going to be talking about the lsat i want to do two videos this is going to be a two-part video on the lsat the first video i'm just going to be talking about my experience specifically any regrets i had what i wish i could have done to do better on the lsat and then next week i'm going to be talking with steve schwartz who is a youtuber and also on instagram and he gives out great advice great tips on the lsat uh, on lsat unplugged so if you want to go ahead and check him out this week before our video next week you should definitely go do that but in this week's video we're going to be talking about my personal experience with the lsat which was let's just say it wasn't all roses and rainbows but we got through it, we made it through, and I want to talk about how I made it through even though I felt like I could have done better and still got into law school. So I'm not going to be like talking about the LSAT and its specific different sections and all, like I'm not here to teach you about how to do better on the LSAT or I'm just giving you more so like advice, like general, general advice on studying and what I wish I could have done better, but not necessarily like the specifics of the actual test i because i can't really i should not be the one telling people about that we'll leave that to steve shorts next week um and you can check out his resources and other resources about how to study better and what you should actually be studying i'm just giving you my personal advice from my own experience this past fall and winter with the lsat because um it was a bumpy road and i am one who says that i'm not very good at standardized tests and my score kind of showed that. But I also think that my score went beyond just showing that I'm not very good at standardized tests. And I think it actually showed that it takes a lot of practice to get really good at standardized tests. So that was probably like one of my biggest takeaways from even the whole like LSAT process is that this is a different kind of beast. It's not something that you ever have like learned before. It's not a test that you can pull outside knowledge from general classes that you've taken before. Like, it's not like the SAT where you've been taking math ever since you were very little. This is not the SAT. This is a whole different beast and one that you actually have to study and get the concepts down before you can actually attempt to even take a single practice test. What I realized very quickly was this wasn't going to be uh, like a one and done, which <laughs> I really was hoping it was going to be and I still kind of hoped even as I was studying I still kind of hoped that it was going to be a one and done but what I realized at least throughout the studying process was that this wasn't going to be something that I could just cram the week before um, and this wasn't going to be something that I would just get off the top of my head because this wasn't knowledge this was not any like knowledge where I have received before in even in, in undergrads like this is completely completely a different type of test my biggest piece of advice and biggest regret was probably one, not giving myself enough time beforehand to study. Like I mentioned in the first video, I only gave myself from August to November before my first exam, which seems like quite a bit of a time. Like, I mean, that's about August, September, October, November. That's like almost four months. However, in the grand scheme of things, those four months go by like that. And if I already felt like I wasn't good at standardized tests from my experience with the SAT and the ACT, I should have actually given myself a lot more time than four months if this is something that I feel like I need to really spend like 
literally all, every waking hour <laughs> learning how to do. So that was my biggest fault was just not giving myself enough time from the jump. I also, like I mentioned in the first video, prioritized traveling as well and getting as much as I could out of my gap year. So I wasn't really willing to cut into my summer. Like I really wanted to have a very good summer before I went and buckled down for this exam. Like most studying programs will tell you that you should at least be giving yourself 12 weeks. So if you are fairly decent with standardized testing, 12 weeks should be enough for you. But if you already know from the get go that you're not very good at standardized testing, then 12 weeks just might not be enough. Maybe like push it out to 16 weeks, maybe even further if you really have the time. Like if you really can devote some more time to this, like depending on like, like if you really have the time, I would devote as much time as you can to studying because that will give you, I think the maximum results possible because you will have spent a sufficient enough time studying and then you can spend even more time taking practice exams, which I think is probably the biggest and the, the, the best way to really gauge how you're gonna do on the official LSAT. Another regret <laughs> that I have in, or that I had, I'm over it now guys, I swear I'm over it, but another kind of little slight regret that I had within the studying process was not really fully being honest with myself about what kind of student I am. I think that throughout high school, at least to the end of college, I really got by with like, because I was, you know, I was just generally a good student. I got I turned in my things on time. I understood concepts, like I did my homework. I did what was needed to be done, but I also really got by by just procrastinating a lot and just doing things at the last minute because you know, pressure produces diamonds. I really got away with that motto for a very long time. And I think that another thing was like, I told myself like, well, you know, you even though you procrastinate, you still get things done on time. No one has to like tell you that you need to be doing your stuff. No one has to hold you accountable. You still get good grades. So like you can be okay just self-studying for the LSAT. And I should have been a little bit more honest with myself knowing that in class, studying would also would have been like supplement to my own self studying i should have taken a course where i would have to be in person um with a with a teacher that's probably one of my regrets was just not doing both and instead just choosing one because i felt like it would work around my work schedule better um like i was telling you guys i was working full 40 hour weeks as waitressing while i was also studying for the exam from august to november because i wanted to save money for my trip in the winter and as you know, I, so I told myself that all I needed to do was just do a prep course by myself and not with a tutor in person or those in-class sessions. And there are some prep courses that do allow you to go in, in class and self-study on your own. And I wish I had done that because I think that that would have, I think the in-class or like at least with a tutor would have just been like that extra supplement that could have possibly help me understand concepts a little bit better and maybe a teacher or a tutor could have given me um, some extra tips on how to execute the exam better so i have no idea like i really don't know to be honest because i just i'm, I'm just kind of speculating and guessing that it would have helped me improve my score but i'm not positive but it is kind of like a low-key regret that i have because i wasn't just fully fully honest with myself about the type of student that i am um, if you got by throughout high school and college and you just kind of like did the bare minimum but you still got really good grades, this is not really the type of, this isn't the time for you to to do that, to like take those skills. Like you need much better studying skills, much better learning skills that you need to apply for the LSAT than you probably have ever done for your undergrad studies or your high school studies. Yeah, I mean, just be honest with yourself about what you are, if you are, a very disciplined person or if you need somebody to hold you accountable don't feel ashamed for answering those questions honestly i think i low-key felt ashamed if i were to say that i couldn't hold my own self accountable and that i didn't have enough self-discipline or self-control to like study properly i felt a little bit ashamed for admitting that and that kind of might have cost me some points for not doing um in class and in-person sessions so i have no idea again because I'll never know unless I would have gone back and done it differently. But I think that if you are truly honest with yourself, like you, you don't have to prove anything to anyone but yourself. So make sure you're giving yourself the best shot possible and be honest with yourself about the type of 
learner that you are and if you need someone to hold you accountable there is nothing wrong with that because at the end of the day if that gets you an extra five points even an extra two points even like that could also make all the difference for you when you are applying to give you that extra boost of confidence when you're applying to law school that you got the score that you knew you could get i also probably should have mentioned this in the in the sort of beginning what i used was called lsat max so what they do is there's different versions that you can get different like levels for different prices but i kind of narrowed it down between a few i think like blueprint and lsat max and then like maybe one other and i did this one because i felt like it was i mean trust me this was not cheap it was still pretty expensive and thank you to my great Gracious, gracious parents for helping me pay for not even helping me for paying for that service because we were like if I had to do that myself I would have been probably just using Khan Academy to be honest because Khan Academy has all of the material LSAT materials for free so if you are on a budget definitely look at that if you are a good like self-disciplined learner you could definitely probably like, I really believe that you could get by and do well just by using the Khan Academy free materials but I wanted to do a little bit more because the LSAT Max does provide online tutoring services which I found very helpful they do online office hours um, you also download this app so you can use it on an iPad which they felt like was important for you to learn how to do it on an iPad because the exam was going to be moved digitally so you're no longer taking it on paper which was hilarious because on both exams I did not take it on the iPad not one time did I take that exam on the iPad I took it on by paper both times because once I one I took it in a different country and the first time I took it um, they were having difficulties with the iPad so I had to take it on paper so that was the the funniest part of all of that was that I was like oh yeah I like I'm gonna choose this service because they're gonna get me right because I'm gonna be using an iPad to study the app was great had a lot of materials unlimited practice tests um, unlimited access to the materials, whatever. And they were gonna get me right because I was gonna take it on an iPad. Not one time did I take it on the iPad. So I played myself, jokes on me, I am a clown. I do believe, I mean, I still have the app. I have, un I literally have unlimited access to it even to this day after taking the exams and being uh, like admitted to law school. So um, I, I mean, it's, it's a good service. It's just, it just depends on how much you're willing to pay. If you have the coin, go for those big prep courses. If you don't have the coin, go for Khan Academy and hopefully you're just a very good self-disciplined um, learner. With what has been going on right now with COVID, that some of this advice might not apply very well to the June LSAT takers and the July LSAT takers because you will be taking the LSAT Flex. I have no idea about the LSAT Flex and we're gonna be talking about the LSAT Flex next week with Steve Schwartz from LSAT Unplugged and he's going to explain to you guys a little bit more about what the LSAT Flex is and just a little bit more of his like commentary on it and what he thinks about it. So I'm not going to really be able to comment on that because once I was done with the LSAT, once I decided I was no longer taking the LSAT anymore and I was just going to apply to school and not defer, um, I didn't think about the LSAT ever again. So it's been kind of like beyond my mind and now this video is causing me to reflect on it a little bit more than I have in the past couple of months. So. Um, the LSAT Flex is really the last thing on my mind at the moment, but we will talk about it for those who are going to be taking the LSAT in the near future and are feeling a little anxious about it. Another regret that I have, this is my last thing that I'm going to say because I don't want to make this video so negative, but my last regret was not having a better plan for when I retook the LSAT. So if you remember, I only took the LSAT twice. I took it once in December and I took it again in January. So one, there wasn't even really that much time in between the exams, but I, what I was really shooting for was not that big of a jump. I was really just shooting for like a five point jump, which in my head at the time, I didn't think was that big of a jump. So I was really just hoping I could boost my score by like five more points to give me a little bit more cushion in January. But that did not happen and I think that a reason why that didn't happen was because I did not go into those three weeks in between or three and a half weeks in between with a solid enough plan for how I was going to study better to retake the exam and actually get a better score. Like you have to be very realistic with this process and know that you you only get what you give. So if you're not attacking this with like an actual strategy, you will come out of it probably not, probably for the worse. And that's that's pretty much what happened to me. I didn't, I did not um, do worse. I got the same score, but it was probably because I studied the same exact way I was studying as when I, uh, from August to November. Make sure that on that in between, when you're gonna retake, that you have a new strategy, that you identify your weak spots, 
and that you actually study for those weak spots. Like make sure you are taking more practice exams so that you can actually improve in those sections that you didn't do so well on because that could be the difference of getting a couple more questions right, which could be the difference of five to 10 points, which is what's so crazy about this exam is that it really is just the difference of a getting a couple questions wrong or getting a couple more questions right. It was the most frustrating thing to really like have to realize and be real with myself about but that's just what we're dealing with here and that's the only way to get into law school so if if this is a process and if this is something that you really really want and another thing that you really really want is to get a really really good score then you have to kind of be real accept the fact that the LSAT is just part of the process and make sure you really do go into it with a plan so now that I've discussed with you my regrets of my LSAT process, which was, again, it was really just being real with myself. Don't, don't, don't lie to yourself about what kind of student you are. If you know you're a certain type of student, because no one knows what kind of student you are but yourself, if you know you're a certain type of student, or if you just even wanted to take the safest route, make sure you do self-study and add some in-person classes as well, or get a tutor if you have the money to do so. I mean, it's just, it could make all the difference. And if something you're genuinely worried about is getting the highest score possible, then why not do everything you can to get the highest score possible? Don't be like me and look back on the process and be like, dang, I probably could have done that a little bit better or I could have made that decision and that could have made me give, maybe given me a five to 10 point boost, which is a huge, huge difference. Given that, despite all that, despite my regrets, I will say that there are some positives and there all hope is not lost if you don't get the highest score possible if you are like me and standardized testing just isn't your jam and if you just don't have the resources to keep taking more LSATs to, to pay for those courses to pay for an iPad if you don't have the, the funds for that there is no problem all hope is not lost for you I'm gonna tell you about some parts of my experience that also kind of helped compensate for my average LSAT score that I thought was not going to get me into any law school. So what I will say is that when throughout my process, what I did learn from through the rest of the process was that it's actually going to be okay, even though you feel like your, your score is super, super average or below a lot of school, schools medians. And the reason why I say that is because you can compensate for your LSAT score in other aspects of your application. Now this means that you did the work prior to the LSAT, prior to even applying to law school in the first place, and you did that work in your undergrad and high school years, mostly undergrad. They don't really care about what you did in high school, but in your undergrad years, for those four years, if you did the work then to make sure you got the best GPA possible that you could, that you were in meaningful organizations, that you had positions of leadership, that you made sure you made the connections in your classes that you needed to make so that you could have good recommendations. If you did that early, early work, I mean, that's even pre thinking about the LSAT. Like if you did that work well, in undergrad you should be set for the rest of for for that application process because yes your your LSAT might not be on par with everything else but the other aspects of your application will help to kind of offset that a little bit now granted that is also under the assumption that you're applying to schools that have a holistic application process application reviewing process um which that's not every school like when we're talking about the harvard the yale stanford schools it's going to be kind of i mean i do think they have the holistic they do the holistic process but there are just going to be some schools that are just not going to take a certain LSAT, and that's just going to be the reality of it but there are also schools within that middle kind of chunk georgetown on that will look at your application with a holistic view, meaning that they're gonna take all parts of the application and they're gonna weigh them and they're gonna kind of just weigh them equally and say, okay, well, yes, her LSAT might not be at our median score. It might not even be in our 25th percentile score, but her personal statement was really good. Her resume is spectacular and her grades are really, really good. She comes from a really good school, she or he, she or he. Throughout that process, they're gonna they're going to be taking everything into account. So that's what I mean by holistic. It's, it's kind of difficult to figure out what schools will do that. 
you for me i really didn't figure that out until the end of my application process um when i found out the schools that i did get into and the schools that i got waitlisted at and i was like hmm i would have never have guessed that this school would have even really actually considered me like georgetown i got waitlisted but i didn't i just thought i was going to be really pushed to the back of the pile and just got rejected from the jump but i didn't and that's because they outwardly are transparent about being a school that looks at applications from with a holistic view and your LSAT is not the end-all be-all. So there are ways to figure this out. One of those resources, weirdly enough, is Reddit. Um, when you go through Reddit and you see some of these kids, a lot of kids are gonna put their end of cycle recap and they're gonna post on there, they're gonna put what LSAT they got, their GPA, whether or not they're a minority, whether or not they're applying straight from undergrad or if they've had some years of uh, work experience before applying. I mean, they will give you everything about them like down to their favorite color. And then they're gonna tell you um, what schools they got waitlisted at, what schools rejected them and what schools got, um, what schools accepted them from the jump. And when you kind of look at that, you can get a little bit of a gauge as to, okay, so there are some schools that will accept lower LSATs with high GPAs or lower GPAs with high LSATs. You can kind of get a feel for every school because um, Reddit is pretty diverse and a lot of kids on there will, I keep saying kids, I mean, these are adults, a lot of people will post about their experiences and the schools that they apply to and they're pretty transparent on there. So as, as much of a dark hole Reddit can be, it's actually a pretty good resource for finding out the T, who, who law schools will accept and what kind of grades and LSAT scores they got. So if you wanna just like, if you, if you have time to scroll through Reddit, I would definitely go through there and look before you apply to schools. Uh, if you want to just get a better read for uh, how schools are picking their students really. Another way, another part of the application process that sort of helps to offset your LSAT score, and this isn't definitely, I mean, this is kind of a long shot and does not always work, but a lot of schools will allow you to write addendums. And for like when I applied to USC University of Southern California, I wrote an addendum about my LSAT score and how I didn't feel like it reflected my potential to be a good law student and that I didn't think it correlated with my GPA and I just wanted like to kind of make a case for myself that I don't think that my LSAT score should be the end-all be-all for my application. So I got waitlisted at USC, did not get automatically accepted, which is why I'm saying it's kind of a long shot to do that. I did not write an addendum for every school. I just did that for USC because they had like, they had a question after like the LSAT, after you submit your LSAT score, there was like a question on there that said something about about like you can write a little bit of an explanation about your LSAT score if there are any discrepancies. I mean, you'll see that a lot on on the LSAT application uh, for many schools. Like if there are any discrepancies with your GPA, like if you took a semester off, I mean, they give you plenty of opportunities to explain discrepancies, whatever you feel, whatever that school considers a discrepancy, whether that's why is your GPA so low? Why is your LSAT score so low? Uh, did you get into any trouble? Why does it say here that you were dismissed from school? Like there'll be lots of opportunities for you to make a case for yourself, defend yourself. And I think that that's probably the best part of the application process. I mean, not to say that it makes it any easier because it's still difficult to you know, write a good personal statement and to make sure that your resume is in tip top shape, but it just presents you with an opportunity to defend yourself, which I think is really important if you do have a discrepancy on there that you feel like you could actually explain and get that cleared so there are no questions left on the table. So I say that because I wanna make sure that people know that even if certain parts of your app application aren't in aren't gonna aren't the best specifically in regards to your gpa or your lsat that you'll have the opportunity to explain yourself um but also if most th this is mostly in regards to if you're applying to schools that are kind of in that middle you know after like the t14 basically when you're applying to those top schools i mean like harvard yale stanford like you're gonna have to be a pretty exceptional student in other aspects if your LSAT isn't where their median LSAT is, even or their 25th percentile LSAT. Like if it's way below that, you're you're kind of 
shooting in the dark right there. Well, that's what I learned when I applied to NYU. And although I felt like other parts of my application were, you know, acceptable, my LSAT was just way too average and they rejected me. Totally fine with that, moved on, and it wasn't my top choice or anything, but I wanted to make sure that I applied to a really, really good top reach school because I just wanted to see if I could do it. And I didn't get in, and that's definitely because of my LSAT, and that's totally, totally fine. But if you are somebody who knows you want to apply to a school like NYU, then this advice isn't really for you because um, you're gonna have to do a lot more than just trying to compensate with an addendum to get you into one of those top schools. That's not to say to let your LSAT score deter you from applying to these schools. And that's probably my biggest piece of advice from this video is regardless of your LSAT score, really try and look at your application, look at yourself as a person as a whole, and not just let yourself get defined by this number. I was, I told you in the first video, I had a breakdown, almost didn't even apply to law school whatsoever, was considering even changing career paths. I had no idea what I was about to do with my life, to be honest. I was being way too dramatic and I needed somebody to check me. And luckily I have good family members who keep it real with me and I realized that I am not just a number, I'm not just that LSAT score. LSAT score cannot define me, period. And that it's gonna be okay. If you don't get the LSAT score you don't want to, you didn't want, it's gonna be okay. And if you don't have the means, primarily if you don't have the funds, you don't have the extra $200 to take another LSAT, if you don't have the extra time even to wait that month or to wait a whole nother year to apply to schools, like. There is nothing wrong with taking that current LSAT and just applying to schools and just seeing what happens. Like, but that also goes the other way as well. If funds are tight and limited, you might wanna take that year off to make sure that you, you do get a better LSAT score and so that you can make sure that you have the best chances possible in your application cycle. So it can kind of go either way. If you feel like you need to act now and you don't wanna spend more money, more time studying, paying for the LSAT, paying for prep courses and all that, Take the LSAT score that you have and bust out a bomb ass personal statement, bust out a really good resume, make sure it's in tip top shape, write those addendums if you need to, make sure the recommendations that you have are gonna really like, really target the type of student that you are and really make sure that these teachers can speak to the, the work that you did in undergrad or the work that you did at your job and you should be in good shape. You will get into a good school. You will get into a school that you will want to attend 100%. I believe it and I'm manifesting it for you. I'm sending you that energy. I wish I had somebody to tell me that because I feel like a lot of things out there are really LSAT score driven. They're very like heavy on the get the best score that you can get, get into the highest ranked school that you can get into. This process is way more than just getting into, getting the highest score and getting into the best school possible. Like this process goes so far beyond those numbers. If you're currently in it, you're probably figuring that stuff out right now where you're realizing like, whoa, it's gonna be way more than just my LSAT score and like getting into the highest ranked school like it's gonna you're gonna have to take so many other things into account once you're into the process of deciding what school to get into so don't just think that the lsat and and the rank like the ranking of the schools are going to be all that you're going to have to consider and again making sure that you also consider applying to schools that aren't in the t14 and and knowing that at the end of the day y'all as long as you get into a school, you can always transfer after the first year. And that was something that I kept reminding myself and it's going to be my last little tip of advice for you is that you can always transfer after that first year and make sure you just kick ass in your first in your 1L. That's that's just my last little tidbit of advice for you. And my last little my parting words of wisdom for you is that at the end of the day, if you get into at least one law school and you you decide that you are willing to go to that law school, you just need to bust your butt in your 1L and then you can transfer. That's all for this week, guys. Next week, we're gonna be a little bit, I'll, I'll probably, <laughs> probably one of my more helpful videos um, in terms of giving you actual real concrete um, tips that you can take 
during your studying process this summer or if you're taking any of the LSAT flexes this summer as well, this will be very helpful, um, a very helpful video for you. And I hope that you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, please give it a like so that I know, like, okay, let's keep going with these, with these types of videos or leave a comment down below if there was any other part of the process that you felt like I didn't touch on yet that you think I should address in future videos. So leave a comment on that. And as always, please, please, please subscribe. We just made, we, <laughs> all of you just got me to 100 plus subscribers. And I'm very like, I was really cheesing because I was like, you know, I'm gonna celebrate this like it's a thousand subscribers because my goal is not to blow up on this, on this platform. I really am just trying to like, I really just enjoy talking and just saying stuff. So I was really proud that I even had gotten to 50 subscribers in the first place, but when it got to 100, I was like, wow, people are actually enjoying watching my videos. People are actually are okay with hearing me talk, and that really like helped me uh, kind of boost my confidence a little bit more in making more videos and putting myself out there more because I now know that people actually enjoy watching my videos. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much for subscribing. I hope we get more subscribers in the future, and I cannot wait to see you guys again next week. Thank you. Bye.